This is Jessica Sheets, Community Engagement Manager for AHI. I want to thank you all for taking the time to be with us today, either in person or on the phone. Um, we realize that many of you are in the process of finishing applications for the Innovation Funds grant, so um, I know the timing of this may, may have been a little challenging, so again, I, I very much appreciate your time. We did not originally anticipate the, the number of people calling in that we, we have, so we had really hoped to do some interactive activities. Um, we may be able to do less of that because of having less, less, uh, less folks here in person. So uh, you'll see on your agenda that our last uh, 30 minutes we had a lot of just some brainstorming activities. We're going to do that as, as question and answer time instead, which I think is um, very valuable. Everybody, I, you know, there are a lot of questions around this project. So, and hopefully uh, what we talk about as we go along will uh, generate more questions and discussion. So, all right, well, I also just wanted to give a quick reminder to anybody on the line that it would be really helpful if you muted your phones um, if, and then Jump in as needed, though. Um, and everyone here in the room, there's coffee and stones in the back, restrooms, ladies' rooms right there, um, and the men's room is up. We go out and go to the end of the hall. We feel free to get up and what you need to do as we go along. Um, all right, so, our in so what we would like to do first is go around, do some introductions, um, and then we wanted to give everybody a chance to kind of break off into small groups and talk a bit with each other about where you are with implementing the project and barriers that you may be encountering. And we'll facilitate that. Um, and then we were looking for one person from each group to kind of report out on where everybody is. So let's, um, let's go around and do introductions. So again, Jessica Shanice, Community Engagement Manager. I'm Melissa Davey, Community Engagement Coordinator and Social Marketing Coordinator. I'm Donna Nichols, the Director of Path Tomorrow Community Center in South Wales Falls. Michelle Smith, Resource Coordinator. Victoria Kinnear, Community Engagement Facilitator. Forrest Hillary with the HI Data Analytics. Wade Woodrick, I'm also HI Data Analytics. Uh, Alex Hompke, Program Assistant, uh, Community Health Services Division. Francis County, Community Health Director, Katie Strack. Crystal Carter with the Clinton County Office for the Aging. I'm Amber Bayat, Community Engagement Facilitator. I do the five southern counties. I'm Ann Hutchinson. I'm the Director of Community Development and Strategic Planning at Bank of America. Eric Walker. I'm Sarah Whitney. I'm the Director of Navigation for Sale. Ann Hutchinson. Nellie here from Community Health Center. I'm sorry, Nellie. I thought it was Nellie. 
It was it was definitely on the system sounding a lot like Nelly. Um, but glad to have you, Nelly. All right, is there anyone else on the line? Hi, yes. Hi, this is Nicole Lisa. Um, I'm the Nicole Lisa Center for Yeah, don't click too much. There's a little bit of a lag. Okay. All right, sorry. sorry. Technical difficulties. I'm the least technically savvy person probably in the room. Um, I will give a quick rundown of where we are. Perfect. Um, we did complete three milestones last quarter. Um, two of those. Sorry. It's okay. We're getting there. Um, don't mind me. No worries. So the milestones completed had to do, you can go to the next slide, Alex. There we go. Thank oh. you. This um, it? Aim at the computer. Oh, sorry. Jesus. <laughs> sorry, everybody. So I misspoke. We actually completed four. However, um, one of those milestones is not, um, but we've got to do some, um, we've got to do some more with it. But the milestones that are complete to date are milestone two, which had to do with uh, PAM training. Milestone three, which is what um, Wade and Forrest are going to talk to you about today because it had to do with hotspotting and identifying the outreach done to date in hotspots. Uh, four was about surveying our um, community members for, uh, in terms of healthcare needs, and we've been doing that through community forums. And 12 had to do, actually 12 has been partially done for quite some time, and it had to do with um, developing a process, a complaint, uh, customer service process for individuals receiving the PAM survey. Um, the, the remainder of our 13 milestones are due on March 31st, 2017. So um, something that I want to emphasize is just because the milestones are due on that date, and I'm sorry my back's due because the um, just because the milestones are due in March, that doesn't mean the project ends. It's almost like that's the beginning. That's where we focus on implementation and ensuring that we are, um, I think I've already said moving the needle, but I'm going to say it again, moving the needle on the outcomes that are going to drive performance, our performance measures moving forward, as well as what's really going to make the difference to the people in our communities. Um, in terms of our speed and scale goals, we you might have aim at this. Aim at that. Okay. So, in terms of our speed and scale goals, um, we've exceeded the goal of training um, 75 individuals by March 31st. We've trained over 175 on PAM and, PAM and coaching for activation. Um, our actively engaged targets, we are working on those. Um, we've completed 4,000 surveys uh, to date throughout the PPS. Um, our goal for this quarter uh, that we're currently in was 32,800 surveys. 
Um, you can see that we're not going to get there. Something I want to mention that um, was discussed in a meeting we had yesterday with the AST, which is our account support team from uh, that acts as a liaison between PPS leads and the state, is that while we absolutely don't want to discount the value of actively engaged and ensuring that we are, and that's, that's how many camp surveys are administered. Um, you know, there's value in bringing and using it as a point of intake, and there's funding attached to those goals. So we don't want to miss that opportunity for funding. However, the AST recognized and said that it's been recognized at the DOH level that where where we want the folk, the bulk of our time and effort and energy to be is on. You get tired of hearing me say it, but is on those those outcomes, those performance measures, such as. Um, increasing utilization of primary and preventative care, um, reducing ED use by, particularly by the uninsured in reference to this project. Um, and while those are clinical measures, community-based organizations and public agencies are key to addressing the social determinants of health that will then allow people to focus on their health and health care. So there's very much a role for all of our partners in moving those measures. So while we definitely want to um, see what we can do to increase administration of the PAM survey, we, we really want to focus on those bigger picture goals as well. Can I just ask, Absolutely. are there consequences for all for not reaching that goal? And there is. There's consequences and the, there's lost funding. Um, however, there is more funding to be lost if we don't, if we don't make progress with those clinical measures moving forward. That's where um, that's where the dollars really are. Okay. Um, and how was that goal calculated? That seems really high. That's a lot of people. Yep. Very rural area. So I didn't know that. So my understanding is that these were calculated, uh, what, two or three years ago at this point? During, what, the during the application process in 2014. Um, and there was an error in, so the, the goals were submitted by the PPSs, but there was an error in our understanding, and it wasn't just us, it was other PPSs as well, as to whether or not what we were submitting was cumulative. Um, so it is recognized that these numbers are very high. Um, overall, I believe through the course of DISRP, um, it's over, what, 200,000 that we're looking to, to survey. Um, which is huge. <laughs> is there any way to get that adjusted? Because I think as the health homes come and that's where you've got to take those people out of there, and that's a big number of yep. people that would be damned. Yes, and unfortunately there is not. We've tried. Um, at, at this point there's not. DOH is not willing to, to move on that. But um, So I think right now it's, I, again, how do we, focus on the bigger picture pieces um, and and you know there are things and you can hear even in the room I, there are ways that we can move towards that goal um, and the benefit of that even if we don't hit the dollars is we're bringing more people into the project and being able to move them towards the other pieces so uh, so yeah and so I'm going to with that um, move to the RFP um, just give you a quick update on that. So this is the the RFP that was released on November 21st for coaching for activation and community navigation. These are two of the four activities addressed in the 2DI addendum. And we, with the addendum, we didn't define, we defined what the pool of dollars was for each activity. Um, I don't believe it's in the addendum, but we know what it is with AHI. Um, and we, but we did not define what each partner would get and the reason for that was we believe that different partner organizations need different amounts of funding. Um, in the RFP itself, we did define what that pool of money is and what we imagined the um, estimated application uh, scope would be in terms of funding. Um, I, I put between 10000 and 40000 in there. I recognize that that's a lot less than what many of you would need. Um, so please submit for what I've been telling people is submit for what you need. What we, I submit for what you need um, to implement this project in a way that is going to work in your setting, and we will go from there. Um, 
So this is not to be confused with the Innovation Funds RFP. That is another, uh, another process in and of itself. Um, the submissions to the, for this RFP will be reviewed and uh, decided upon by the Community and Beneficiary Engagement Committee with uh, Crystal Carter as the chair. Um, and while a 2DI addendum, signed addendum is not required for applying, for applying to the RFP, it will be required to to receive the funds. So, um, so the RFP we're asking for back by the 19th of this month. Um, we meet, the committee meets January, in the first week of January. Um, and that's the, the primary focus of that meeting is going to be reviewing the RFPs. Um, if we can make decisions, then we will. Um, if, if we need to go into February or if we need to, to add additional meetings between Jan, you know, January and February to get there, my goal is to have the decisions made and funding ready to go by February because, again, we're... Yep. And funding is May 1st. It's May 1st. So the, 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 the expense would need to be... we are paying up front with this. It's, it's more of like it's a grant. We are, we're, I believe in this case we're paying up front with this. Um, if there is training and things associated with what you're doing or what you've been doing, there are places that other pieces of uh, DSERP that you can apply for reimbursement for funding, but with this it'll be up front. Um, all right, so with that, I am going to turn it over to Forrest Hillary and Wade Widrick to talk a bit about what they did with our hot spotting. Sit down. Okay. Uh, that was probably fun. Um, so I've got the, the kind of thing that we weren't supposed to do in the film for some of us, but uh, I think you guys are going to see that uh, data and visualization is going to play a really big role in this project as a whole. So basically, as an overview, uh, data visualization combines principles from psychology, usability, graphic design, and statistics um, to highlight important data in accessible and appealing formats. Uh, Forrest and I use Tableau a lot, and basically Tableau is really a visualization tool that allows people to more accurately see and understand their data. Uh, Tableau is an extremely useful way to get the data that like, traditionally comes in table form or like uh, tabular form and we can really manipulate it and pull out patterns that like you wouldn't normally see in the data. Uh, so like we believe as a whole visualization and Tableau can really you know play an essential part in the success of Distro in, a ge in general the success of Distro and all of its underlying projects as well. Uh, and it's kind of the idea that really everybody can benefit from visually seeing the data, you know, the whole a picture's worth a thousand words. If you visually see it, our data can really tell a story more than just if you're looking at, you know, an Excel sheet. Um, so there are some challenges though, especially in terms of healthcare data. There's a lot of challenges with just, uh, you know, figuring out a way to get from information uh, to insight to action is kind of the biggest, the, the real challenge. Um, so this is more of just like a Medicaid, you know, the, the domain was, uh, or not the domain, but the milestone was really, uh, this is more of a general overview of the milestone if we're using like an information insight action type thing. So the information for us would just be to get all of the needed data uh, the insight would be for us to use Tableau, um, you know, and find the trends in the data, find really, you know, what are we seeing, what areas are good, and what areas are problematic. And then taking action would be the part where everybody else comes in, you know, partners come in. Once we find problematic areas, you know, how can we work with the partners to figure out how to address those areas, especially in terms of 
especially in terms of you know the non-utilizers and things like that. Um, so right there is the actual project, the 2DI project milestone, and that's an exact, I think, an exact screenshot right from what DOH gave us. Um, so I think that this is kind of more of an analytic approach to it. More of an analytic approach to it is, you know, we would use data acquisition, which is, again, us identifying the appropriate data sources and kind of figuring out how to pull them. Um, and the state really didn't give us any background on that at all. It was kind of, you know, here's, try to figure out where the data sources are. Um, and that's kind of something that Forrest and I really run into a lot. Um, and then the second approach would be data understanding. So data understanding would be more of us using, you know, statistical software to try to understand what's happening, like, at the actual zip code level. And once we figure out what's happening at the zip code level, level you know, in regards to non-utilizers, low utilizers, and the uninsured, then we can take our step towards like visualization and actually mapping that data. So I think Forrest will kind of show, you know, how he did it visually and through Tableau and what he did statistically as well. Right. So like Wade mentioned. Um, the state didn't exactly give us an itemized list of where to find all this data. Jessica basically just said, we have this due, can we do this? So we have to find a way. And a big part of the effort is to find out where that data is and then to get your hands on it. Um, so we started by using the Salient Interactive Miner tool, which is a tool that sits on top of state uh, Medicaid data warehouse. It allows you to query data. Um, so that was, uh, that was actually very handy. It was the source for the non-utilizers and the low utilizers. With regard to the non-utilizers, it was readily available. That, that data is just kind of sitting there already pre-queried, ready for us to grab. So that was simple. The low utilizers required a little bit more effort uh, in defining the logic. So we had to work with the salient support staff uh, to come up with this basically definition on what are we saying is a low utilizer, and we were arrived at um, somebody, an AHI attributed member with three or fewer primary care visits and a Medicare, or I'm sorry, managed care fee for service claim count between one and five over a 12 month period. That definition would mean you're a low utilizer. So we were able to extract that data from the SIM tool uh, at the zip code level. And for the uninsured, a little bit more tricky, um, that data is not in the SIM tool, so we actually ended up using open data. Uh, just data that's available on the internet. SAHIE is the small area health insurance estimate data set, and that's on the census website. And Enroll America, which is a nonprofit that uh, works a lot with uh, healthcare enrollment data at the county level. Uh, so the next step, once we get our hands on this data, is try to understand what's going on. I don't want to get too technical talking about distributions and that kind of stuff, so we'll just hit the high notes, and that's, um, there were a lot of zip codes that we saw in, in the definitions uh, in the extracted data that had pretty low numbers of total attributed members. So let's say the zip code had five members attributed to it, and three of them were non-utilizing. That's kind of an artificially inflated percentage of non-utilizers. If you put that on a map, and you're coloring by quartiles of, of percentages, is that really a hotspot with five people? Probably not what we're looking for, right? So we made the decision to go ahead and exclude zip codes that were lower than 50 total attributed members to try to artificially constrain those zip codes to the nine counties in the upstate region. And that's what it looks like. Uh, once we can, once we do that using the statistical software, we plug this into Tableau, which gives us a geographical representation defined by quartiles. The dark red areas would be your, your zip codes of uh, high percentage or highest percentage of non-utilizers. So it's pretty clear. You can see the pockets uh, sprinkled around. Uh, next, Alex. But that doesn't exactly answer the, the mail for the whole milestone. The milestone was do that, but also show us where we have partner locations of where we've done outreach. So essentially, we need to create two maps. One for the previous slide, which 
does this with the color scheme change from red to gray on top and then down below is the geographical locations of all the partners and the outreach sites that we've already done and then next up and then over land to see where we've where we've done work so far and it's pretty clear that we can see that some dark some dark gray areas that don't have colored dots next to them uh, this is a little bit um, a little bit easier to try to wrap your head around with the actual Tableau file, which I think we are going to make available. That was, yep, I just wanted to add that, that we will make that available um, after, we'll, we'll send it out after the meeting with... Um, and that's a lot more interactive, yep. so you can actually choose, you know, the area, the non-utilizer, utilizer. It's, it's really cool. You can roll over and things come, it's really, it's very interesting. Um, and. You know, what's Forrest, you're going to explain, one of you will explain mm -hmm. how they go about being able to use that. Yeah, we'll send out communication on how to do that. You can visual, uh, you'll be able to open the package, the, the file, with a free software download. Um, we'll tell you how to do that. Um, Is this going to be, are you going to put this on the public um, It would make sense, right? That's where all the data is. That would make sense. Um, we had not thought to do that. That's something we can look at. Mm -hmm. Point. Tableau has a web publishing feature. Yeah, this is awesome. It might be helpful to write the managed care plan, too, because we only have a few that work in our counties, and they're, they tend to be consistent, and I bet they have a lot of data from the Medicaid population already broken down to zip code level, and they'd be really great to partner with because they're doing their own kind of outreach to those areas of the people that are, that, and they, they want us to really be doing that work because they are measured by availability of some county data is pretty rare. I mean, there's a ton of data available at the county level, which ultimately is not super helpful to us. Uh, so if you can get some county level, whether it be a census tract or zip code, whatever it may be, that would be hugely beneficial. And there's actually a, um, a to the end milestone that uh, centers on working with the managed care organizations to um, to get member information from them to then uh, give to the partners to do outreach. And so it's, it's sort of what, it's what you're talking about. Um, so we're, we're in the process of starting that conversation. But so I think you're right, this would be great to help with that. Oh, was, I'm sorry, did somebody on the phone ask why there's not sub-county information? No? Okay. Um, right ahead. Right, good. Oh, uh, we have a couple more on the uninsured. Um, those sources, again, were not available at Southern County. That's county level information that we had. Um, and uh, I thought it would be interesting to kind of stratify that by age ranges. Do we see a difference between uninsured, uh, between the age ranges? And you can see that there is. There's a, there's a difference in where people of different age ages have higher percentages of uninsured. Um, so uh, 18 and under on the left, Oops. and then, no, it's fine. Oh, 18 right. to 64, and then 65 plus down in the bottom right. Um, and then again, this is the same kind of concept, overlaid with partner locations and where um, where we've done outreach so far. All right, any, any questions for Forrest and Wade? So the data source that we used uh, for the non and low utilizers, the SIM tool, does not have PHI level information. So no, there's no short answer. Um, and the second question was, can we share? I believe that there is no PHI involved. It is downstream shareable with partners. Um, and like Jessica mentioned, we will be able to send out uh, that Tableau file and with a quick free download. Folks are welcome to peruse it. And I think that's also part of what with the MCOs, I believe we will be able to have, or the, it's, it's more going to be, 
actually communication between the MCOs and partners that will facilitate, and there should be patient level data. All right, so if there's not any more questions for Forrest and Wade, thank you guys so much. Um, we'll make sure everybody gets the Tableau file instructions for how to open it after 